Here is my disclaimer. I'm now going to tell you that I think I know five ultimate truths, right? Going back to the illusion of knowledge, you need to remember that no one knows the truth. And most certainly, I don't, okay? So my disclaimer before I, I, I tell you what I think is true is that this is what I think is true, okay? You don't have to agree with it. You can think of other things as true, and you can think of those things as false, okay? Disclaimer. So in my view, the five ultimate truths are those. Now is, is real, change is real, love is real, death, unfortunately, is real, and the grand design is real, okay? As I said, these are my truths, uh, and you need to find yours. But why do you need to find yours? Here's the interesting question. So remember that, so, so we, we go back to archery, right? Remember that whole process of incessant thought, okay? The process of incessant thought takes every event that happens in your life, compares it to your expectation, marks it as good or bad, and then you're either happy or unhappy based on your happiness equation, right? Simple, you, 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 you take every single event and you take it through that lens of thinking, okay? But Zen archers, master archers, don't do that all the time. They don't take every single shot and compare it to everything and try to make it work. They simply have an instinct for how they can hit the bull's eye. They factor in the rain, they factor in the wind, they know how to hit it. They, don't, they can be blindfolded and still hit it, okay? I liken this to navigating a familiar territory as compared to navigating a place that you've never seen before, okay? When you're navigating a place that you've never seen before, you're constantly looking at the map, you're looking at the names of the streets, you're trying to find where you are, I'm supposed to be moving north, okay, so now I'm supposed to be here, aha, there is the building that they talk about. You're constantly assessing every step of your way as you navigate an, a, a territory, right? This is incessant thought. Every change that happens leads you to think and reassess and see if it, if it meets your expectations or not, okay? But if you navigate a familiar territory, a territory that you've navigated many times before, you don't constantly go back to the map. You have a few signposts that says, okay, when I see the blue building, I'll take right. After the speed bump, I will go left, and I will get where I want. Okay? It becomes second instinct, second nature, if you want. It becomes instinctive, you know where you're going, you really don't need to look at the map anymore. You, need, you don't need to go through the assessment uh, uh, process. Okay? When you do that, your, uh, um, all you really know, need is those few signposts. In my view, the signposts are the truth. Okay? If you have a few universal truths, okay, and compare your life to them, Every event seems to, be, to go in place. Every se event seems to be as you expected it, okay? So I'll take you through mine very, very quickly. So in, in Soul for Happy, I, I really go not into the depths of why this is true, because many of them you will agree anyway, okay? But, I, but it's really all of the practice exercises of how can you in, embrace that now is real. Does anyone disagree that now is the only reality, that future has not yet happened and that past is gone and you cannot do anything about it? Now is the only moment in time that is real, okay? Everything that has ever happened in the past happened in a moment of now. When it happened, it was now, then now you call it the past. Everything that will ever happen in the future will happen in a moment of now. When you reach it, it will be now. It's the only truth. Now, as I told you, your brain needs a time stamp to survive, okay? Your brain needs to, to continue to incessantly think it needs a time stamp. The only way you can succeed to stop the incessant thoughts is really to remove the time stamp, and the, the way to do that is to be aware, okay? I'm not gonna go into the details. There are many, many techniques around awareness. Meditation is one of them, but I, you know, I think the, the, uh, you know, the, the shut the duck up exercise that we spoke about is probably one of my favorites. It's to constantly be aware of the world around you, okay? When you're stuck in traffic, instead of cursing your life, start to be aware of the world around you, right? Look at the palm tree on the side, look at the bird jumping on the grass, you will see things that you've never seen before, okay? The other one is change is real. Do I need to convince you of this? Butterfly effects and you know, black swans, life will constantly change, 
Okay? And as we try to thrive in that constant change, what do we do? We end up in uh, a constant attempt to manage a billion little parameters, which is absolutely impossible. The only way to manage a life where change is constant is probably to adopt the, uh, the, uh, the Buddhist approach to things, which is to find the equilibrium of the pendulum. Okay? As life, uh, the more, the, you know, if you try to take your life out of balance, try to be something that you, re that you are not, uh, it takes effort to stay in that place. Okay? The only comfortable place for a pendulum is when it's pointing down, when it's in its balance point. Okay? You look at your, at your balance point in everything, and you follow that, that constant balance, and you will be on the path. Uh, the Buddhist belief is that if you're on that path, that path leads to nirvana. Okay? In Islam, we call it the straight line or the straight path. Okay? That you, know, you, you go on that path, and it ends up in heaven. Right? It's one line, and that line is the line of balance, of a balanced life. Okay? You think about it in simple terms. If you eat too much, your stomach hurts. If you eat too little, you're weak. Uh, you know, somewhere in the middle, you know, the path is eat reasonably, eat healthy, and you will be okay. You will not suffer this, you will not suffer that. If you work out too much, you get muscle pain. If you don't work out at all, you're not healthy. Find your path in the middle and go through that and connect the, the balance points and you will be okay. So uh, if change is real, truly try to, avoid, try to avoid all the change by finding the path, by finding the balance point. <coughs> Love is real. So I had 300 early readers on, uh, on Soul for Happy. Uh, every man that read Soul for Happy rated this chapter a four. Every woman rated it a nine. So I have a problem. But anyway, there seems to be more women readers in the world than men, so... <laughs> Who cares, you guys, okay? Uh, so I, I have a simple theory because I think there are two types of love, okay? There is uh, conditional love or material love, which happens in your brain, okay? Uh, she is very pretty, this is why I love her. Or she makes me laugh, this is why I love her, okay? Which basically means when she's no longer pretty, I'm not gonna love her, or if she stops making me laugh, I'm not going to love her, right? And, and that kind of love is conditional. It's based on, on, the, on, on the conditions of the physical world, and it is not real, okay? This is the kind of love that you get in all pop songs, like Freddie Mercury saying, love kills, right? Why does it kill? Because it doesn't last, it hurts, and it ends up making you uh, miss expectations, right? I was expecting love to go in a certain way, but the world changed, and so um, I ended up missing my expectations, and it hurts. Right? The other type of love is love that happens in the heart, not this heart, but whatever the heart is, which is unconditional. Okay? I love butterflies. I have no idea why, I just love butterflies. I love every single one of them that I have ever seen, even the ones that have no color at all. I just love butterflies. Okay? I don't expect them to do anything to me. They are never going to add value to my life. They're not going to make me richer or poorer, uh, you know, stronger or weaker. They're not going to feed me or give me money. There is no thing that butterflies can give me, but I love butterflies, totally unconditionally. Okay? Now, that kind of love is real. That kind of love is actually the true nature's love. Right? And that continues to be there all the time. Uh, and my theory is that if that kind of love is real, then you might as well love everything and everyone, especially yourself. And if you love everything and everyone, you should probably try to be kind to everything and everyone. Okay? Again, I'm not covering most of these because we don't have time, and it's been a very long day for you guys. But just think about that for, 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 you know, when, when you're back home today. The last one is one that I'm absolutely not going to discuss today, okay? Because it's a very controversial topic, uh, where um, I tend to believe that there is... Ma okay, so, so I tend to believe that there are two views of the world. One is the creationist view of, you know, uh, some big guy up there created everything, and the other is the evolutionist view where randomness and, and natural selection created everything. I went through a cycle when I was young at age 16 where I actually went through the mathematics of this, and I believe neither of them can prove with 100% certainty their theory. Okay? 
Neither do the creationists have ever, they have never witnessed the creator, so they can never really, with observable evidence, as we do in science, uh, uh, you know, prove that there is a creator, and neither do the evolutionists have ever witnessed actual evolution, okay? They've witnessed sing signs of evolution uh, that can create a story, as uh, Yoan was kindly, sorry, Yoan was kindly saying, I, uh, what did you say, I worship evolution, like, just like others worship God. Uh, yeah, so, so truly it's a, just another story you can prove neither with absolute certainty. But my view is that when you have something that you cannot prove with certainty, what do you rely on? Mathematics, right? You go through probabilities. What's the probability of this being true and what's the probability of that being true? And with my mathematical calculations, I tend to believe that um, I tend to believe that there is a high, more, more, a highly likelihood that our universe, that our miraculous universe, happened as a result of design, not as a result of uh, pure luck. Okay, even if pure luck happened over an infinity of time, right? Uh, I, the, 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 the example I cite of that is, you know, my daughter's iPhone. We did not buy in store, by the way. Okay, this iPhone happened because. In infinite time, in the sand patch behind our home, the sun melted the sand, and the sand broke, you know, made it, made it glass, and it broke in the exact right corners to fall in an aluminum box that was milled through years and years of sand, uh, you know, and wind, uh, just to cover a screen and, and, and electronics that co all came out of sand, and the software was written on a computer uh, in our neighbor's yard, which also happened to have happened randomly with infinite time, I don't care if that upsets Steve Jobs because really there was never a Steve Jobs, okay? That view to me has actually been uh, stuck with me for my whole life. I tend to believe that even though I think I'm a magnificent machine, that this machine was actually made, okay? That there is more to the universe than what I know and that there is actually a way to consider that it had to be designed all at once for it to fall in place that way. That doesn't matter for our topic, okay? What matters for our topic is that nothing is random, okay? The fact that Ali died, okay, is not a bad throw of luck. It's not, it's not a bad throw of the dice. The fact that Ali died is very simple. The butterfly effect was that he ate something bad in Boston that inflammated his, uh, his uh, appendix, and the black swan was that the doctor made a mistake. It's as simple as that, okay? There is no randomness in it. There is no luck involved. There are reasons for things that follow predictable equations. There is no randomness. There is no, uh, uh, you know, reason to believe that things, that, that events will miss expectations. Events will always, always meet expectations. Okay? And um, so that leads you to committed acceptance again. Uh, you know, when you know that things happen for a reason, it leads you to committed acceptance. And thank you for not pushing back on the argument so that we can go into the real argument now. Death is real. I actually will probably want to look at this when we're talking. Um, death is real, okay? As much as we hate to die, uh, or for loved ones to die, death is real. And the reason I'm talking to you about this is that everything I spoke to you about today can make you happy in the face of losing a car, or losing a job, or losing you know, a salary, or whatever, losing a, a, loved, you know, a, a lover, or whatever. But it wouldn't make you happy in the face of losing a child, especially one that's as wonderful as my son was. And so I felt at a point in time, while I wanted to avoid talking about those two topics, death and the design, I felt it would be in, you know, not genuine uh, to, to tell that story and tell people that you can be happy that way. So I'll, I'll try to tell you the truth about death, okay? The truth about death is that there is not a... Uh, so, so there are five big myths, I believe, around death. One of them is that there is a day when you die, okay? There isn't a day where you die. You die the day you are born, okay? You can, dying is a process that we all go through every single day of our life. It's a process that is actually integral to life, okay? It is a process that is so much part of life that you can really not separate them, okay? As a matter of fact, death is not the enemy. Death is the only supporter of life. There is no way we can survive 
unless we eat something that has just died, okay? There is no way that life can continue to survive unless the cycle of death and life continues, okay? It's just part of what life is. It's the mechanical design of how things work. Death feeds life, okay? Death is the reason we live. And we think that death is, al is always unwelcome, but that's absolutely not true, okay? Death is unwelcome when we're so attached to life. Many people will say in their 20s, 30s, 40s, that, hey, I just don't want to die, I want to enjoy this, this is fun, this is okay, I'm good, right? But ask someone like my dear, dear loved uh, Omar, the son of my friend, okay? When he's been suffering for two and a half years of a stage four cancer with all of the issues that come with cancer, okay? At a point in time, Omar openly said, hey, I'm okay with dying, right? Somehow it becomes a welcome visitor when life is not that great anymore. And death is painful is a huge myth. As a matter of fact, as Woody Allen says, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not scared of death, I'm not gonna he be here when it happens, right? Death is not really painful, what's painful is the last stage of life, so you might as well see it that way. And, and I think the biggest myth we have is what, ha what the healthcare industry has, has convinced us of, that death can be cheated, okay? Death cannot be cheated. Uh, you know, they, they, they sell the brand as saving lives. No one has ever saved a life. They prolonged it, okay? But you cannot save it. We will all get there. I, I'm not depressing you. I'll get to the positive side in a minute, okay? I just want you to understand that, um, that it's not what you think it is. I personally had a, a near-death experience. Have, has, have, do you, are you aware of what near-death experiences are? Yeah? There has been many stories about near-death experiences that all sound exactly the same. The tunnel, the light, and then you end up in a place that is peaceful and wonderful, and you're like, oh, this is cool. Normally they say you get to meet loved ones, I didn't get to meet any, but I can tell you this. At the end of my near-death experience, I seriously came back and I said, whoa, that was so much fun, I wanna go again, okay? Like seriously, it's such an interesting place to be, to go through that interesting light of that tunnel of light. Uh, and then at the end of the tunnel of light, it's so zen and peaceful and like blurry white like a fluorescent light in an interesting way. That could be a brain defect, by the way. This, is, this could be the way our brains react to dying, okay? It's cool nonetheless. To be honest, it's not, it wasn't that bad, right? Um, now, let's talk about life. There, there needs to be an understanding of what life really is. I, there is something that I call the long life continuum, okay? If you think about any of us, any of the you know, amazing philosophers that lived, they lived a tiny bit versus the time they died, okay? If you think about our 60 to 80 to 90 years of, uh, of life expectancy on this planet, compared to the 13.7 .7 billion years of the universe, Right? It's really very insignificant, the amount of life compared to the amount of death. If, if you actually take the combined 200 million years of life, was it 200 million years of life, versus the 4.5 billion years of the life of planet Earth, uh, life is very insignificant compared to the lack of life, if you want, which has to take you through a few questions. I'm going to take you back to Einstein's... Um, Einstein's... Um, Oops, Einstein's um, uh, uh, relativity, right, about time, okay? We, uh, we spoke about uh, how time is not real. Did you, did you remember that bit that was holy guacamole, right? Uh, time exists, all of space-time continues, Continu the continu continuum exists, exists at the same time. Now you need to ask yourself this, okay? If all of time exists, then who was born first? Me or Ali? Who died first? Me or Ali? First is a character of time. Last is a character of time. Okay? It's really, really interesting. I, I don't even know the answer to that. Right? I don't even know the answer to how can there be no time and there could be life and death. Right? Think a little further than that. Think of, think of the Big Bang itself. Are, are any of you aware of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, a little bit? No? Uh, Schrodinger's, 
Schrodinger's cat? Anyone aware of Schrodinger's cat? Okay, so I'll, I'll just on, touch on that very, very briefly. Uh, in quantum physics, anything that is subatomic, okay, anything that is smaller than an atom, um, they don't exist until you observe them. Do you understand that? So in, when, when something is subatomic, so I, you know, you're here, I can see you, you are here and you cannot be here and in New York at the same time, okay? Photons can. Photons actually are here and in New York at the same time. They are there in a, what they call the probability wave. They can be anywhere in the universe with a probability. Again, this is science, right? So go and watch on YouTube, go and watch the uh, double slit experiment, okay? They only collapse and be here or in New York when they're observed. The, 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 the probability wave collapses and turns into an, uh, an actual particle when they're observed by life. When life observes a subatomic particle, that subatomic particle becomes a particle. Um, otherwise, it's a probability. It doesn't exist. Okay? Now, I need you to, to, go, to go back to the Big Bang. The theory of the Big Bang is that we had one mass, one piece of mass that was compressed so tight and then exploded to create our entire universe. Right? That one piece of mass had to be observed by life to exist. You understand this? Okay. The 13.5 billion years from the explosion until the time we ended up seeing the first life had to be observed by life to exist. Right? So you can tell me, no, no, the original mass didn't have to be observed by life. Physics didn't apply then. Yeah, of course. But then for 13.5 billion years, our universe formed. It formed into galaxies and planets, and you know, those planets had you know, whatever on them. But life had to observe all of this for Schrodinger's cat to exist. You understand this? There was always life. So you have to think of birth as the opposite of death. Life is not the opposite of death in my philosophy. We come to this physical universe through birth, and we leave this physical universe through death, okay? But that physical universe is not the whole story, okay? As a matter of fact, my view of life goes as follows. So, um, I told you, Ali, I, I had Ali when he was a very young child, when I was a very young man, so I had him, I think, at 25 or 24, maybe. And so, we played a ton of video games together. My favorite was uh, Halo, okay? Uh, I played Halo extensively with Ali. We would, we would play for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, being a reasonably okay man, we had a huge screen TV, surround sound, closed room, and you would, you know, we had that nice uh, blue sofa. We would sit there, and it felt real. Okay, any of you know Halo, by the way? Master Chief goes around uh, killing aliens and grunts, and you know, they kill him and step on him and squish him with cars and shoot him with you know, uh, uh, um, laser beams and everything. And, if, you know, and, and the surround sound makes it so real that when you are sitting there, you're watching this, if you were next to us on the sofa, you, know, you would think we are being battered. It's like, you know, they're really killing you. They're stepping on you. They're hurting you. And at the end of the game, we would put the controllers down and say, whoa, that was fun. And if you were sitting there, you would say, are you mad? What fun? This was horrible. You know, you were killed, you were cut into pieces, they stepped on you, they spit on you, they burnt you, you know, it was horrible. No, no, it wasn't me, it was the avatar. I'm okay, I'm here on the sofa, nothing's wrong. Right? Absolutely nothing's wrong. The avatar is going through all of this, it was fun. Ali, had, Ali was a serious gamer, I mean, I beat him when he was five, but like when he was six, he beat me every time, okay? I, I actually think it was very gracious of him to let, him, to let me play with him, right? He would... He would run to the difficult parts of the game. And you know, the, a gamer like I, who's so strategic, would go through the game and say, Ali, if we go right from here, we will avoid a huge battle. Like seriously, let's just go right from here. And Ali would look for the explosions. He would look for the places where things are really rough. There is smoke, there is explosions, there is 1,400 people 
to fight with from the enemy, and he would run there. I would say, Ali, why? Why are you running there? And he says, that's where the fun is, right? That's when you learn, develop, and grow. That's when life becomes exciting, when life becomes interesting, when the game really is worth living, is worth playing, okay? If you avoid it and just go through life on the, on the, on the, you know, on the edges, hmm, you don't enjoy any of this. He would go through those places and go through them with enjoying the whole game. Serious gamers know of cheats. Anyone knows of cheats? Cheats are those parts of the game where you would find the little corner on the right, okay? And, you know, you, you know, I would be running. I was always behind him, of course. He would be running fast through the game, and he would take a right turn and go through a tree and disappear, right? And then put his controller down and say, and say hey, Papa, I'm waiting for you at the next level, right? I, of course, wouldn't find those things, so I would plow through the rest of the game, right? I would run and run and run until I get to the next level of the game, and then we start playing again, okay? In my view, what happened in July 2014 is that Ali found a shortcut, okay? If you think of us as not this physical body, okay? If you think of us as the avatar who's sitting on the blue sofa playing somewhere, okay? My view of, of what happened is that, at a point in the game, Ali found a shortcut. He took a right turn, okay, and he went through this level to the next level. What decayed was his avatar, okay, but he still lives. Still lives because he always lived, because always is a character of time. You understand this? In the absence of time, we're always there, right? Someday, I will find a shortcut, whether that day is now or in 27 years' time or in 40 years' time, it doesn't matter because time is an illusion. It goes like that, okay? What matters truly is what you do in those 40 years. It doesn't matter how it goes. So with that game, I started to build my philosophy around three things around death, okay? Um, we think that death is inevitable, okay? But death is part of life. And life is inevitable. That's the truth. The truth is that you're gonna die someday, but between now and that day, you're gonna live. And that's what we tend to miss, okay? And if life is ine inevitable, and death is inevitable at the end of it, you might as well surrender. You might as well take death out of the equation. Remember C, when A, equals two B, A plus C equals 2B plus C, you take C out of the equation. You behave as if the death that is inevitable is going to happen anyway. Life that's inevitable is what you need to solve for, okay? And life is now. Truly, 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 this was the turning point for me to get up and write Soul for Happy, okay? Because life is now. The only thing I can affect is now. And, you know, between birth and death are the two, you know, covers of a book. What truly matters is what you write in the middle, right? What, you, what truly matters is not what you, uh, what the two covers look like. Hmm? What truly matters is what is in the pages in between, okay? And so what I, what I ask everyone is to live. Live before you die, because you will die. Just live before you die. And here is the most interesting bit, okay? I told you I was always, always, always a control freak. I planned everything, I knew everything to the tiniest detail. I am an engineer and a business executive. It doesn't get worse than that, right? And so, when Ali goes, you realize that you have zero control and that life truly, truly is a rental, okay? This concept would change your life. All of my money, I will leave behind. All of my cars will be somebody else's cars. I don't have many cars anymore. If one, anyone wants one, let me know, okay? Uh, you know, all, all, everything, everything, you know, will become someone else's. My daughter will become someone's husband, right? My, uh, my job will become someone else's job. My desk will become someone else's desk. 
everything that you have in life, when you realize that you're going to die and leave it, you realize that it's just a rental. Maybe a lifetime rental, that's okay, but it's still a rental. It's never really yours. It's never really yours. Your money is not yours. Your money is Citibank's until you briefly use it and then you give it away to someone and then you take something in return but your money is still not yours, right? And then that money, when you go, is your daughters and your wives and your families, and you give it to charity, you know, however, okay? It's really never yours. It really never lasts. And so the bit that, you know, that really caught me when Ali left and everyone sent us nice emails saying, rest in peace, Ali, okay? Is why do we wait until we rest in peace when we've lost it all? Why don't we just live in peace, okay? Whatever is taken, who gives a damn? Seriously, it's, not, it's gonna be taken eventually anyway, right? So my whole concept is that while death is probably the most unwelcome visitor any one of us will ever have, death tends to be a reminder, it tends to be a coach, it tends to, re to, to remind you that what matters is life, really, okay? What matters is to, to, is to stay here and now and realize I can never bring Ali back, but I can live in a way that makes Ali proud, okay? And I know this is a little too emotional, if you want, but uh, Ali um, had, a, had that peace. He lives through life. That was the tattoo I wanted to get. Ali lived through life with a tattoo on his back, half of his back, that said, the gravity of the battle means nothing to those at peace. Okay? And that is so true, Ali. When he was on the hospital bed in his scrubs going into the operations room, this was the last word he, said, he told me. The last thing he told me was, by sitting up in his scrubs, I could read on his back that the gravity of the battle means nothing to those at peace. That peace is the joy I'm telling you about. It's to go through life understanding that it's just life. It goes on. Enjoy it tremendously. Live before you die, okay? But don't hang on too much. It's just a game. So when it's a game, you have fun. That's what you do. It's a game, so have fun, okay? We'll chat. I have one more tip to tell you at the end, but let's chat about this for a minute. Mo, a lot of the arguments you bring up and the topics are so rooted in reason and logic that sometimes I worry that there's a loss of feeling and emotion. And you focus on joy, which is great, but then you talk about the Uber driver and how it makes you upset, but you move on. But sometimes it's good to feel angry. Sometimes that feeling of, I'm so angry, gets me to that point where it's not that bad. Mm. But it almost seems like we skip those moments sometimes. Believe me, there is a pile of feeling, okay? I told you very openly, I cry almost every third day for missing Ali, right? There's nothing in the world I want more to have my son next to me. He's my best friend, right? But if the feeling is just going to make things worse, you take the feeling and you do something about it, okay? You, you absolutely feel angry. It's only human to feel angry, okay? But when you feel angry, then you have a choice. Do you want the extra two weeks of pain from the root canal or not? Or do you tell your brain, brain to behave? Do you tell your brain, when you sit in a meeting room, do you tell your brain to focus on the presentation? Yes, you do. Why do you do that? Because you think it's the right thing to do. Right? You could be bored like hell, you could hate the presenter, but you will still do it. And all I'm trying to say is, of course we feel angry, of course I feel sad, of course I miss him, of course I cry for losing him, okay? But what do you do with that? What good is that, okay? Other than make me, making me feel worse. The only thing I can do with that feeling is every time I cry, hmm, I tell myself I'm gonna make you proud. I'm gonna do what you told me to do, Ali. Okay, I'm gonna continue to do what you told me to do. I'm gonna continue to make a difference. Right? That's the only thing you can do. It doesn't mean I'm not sad, okay? It doesn't mean that, you know, there is a difference. It doesn't mean that I'm not in pain, but it means that I'm not in suffering. I don't allow my brain 
to regenerate pain that's unnecessary. There is enough pain in the world without having to regenerate pain. You understand that? But I know it's difficult. It takes a ton of practice. One of the examples you gave was the Zen archer, where it becomes so natural for him to hit that bullseye point that it just hits over and over and over again. But I feel like that's boredom. When you already know what's the end, what's the point? The archer loses that desire, that feeling, that newness of every day, thinking, am I going to hit this or am I not? When it becomes so repetitive and routine. Um, very interesting point. I don't know the answer to that. Um, boredom. So, so you, you could probably think of that uh, archer really more in flow than in boredom, right? So when you, when you think about the, you know, the super musicians who are playing the same piece of music over and over, they're really not bored. They're just really, really in the, in the zone of what they know how to do, okay? They really are very, in, you know, um, they're in the, in the place where they need to be. The place where they need to be is the place where they, in, they have the joy of being. I, I, know it's very, I know what I'm saying is very difficult. And, and I would probably think that many of us have never experienced that feeling of joy. Okay? But joy is not boring in any way. For me to be able to sit on a 16 hours flight on Emirates Airlines coming from Dubai to San Francisco twice a month, right? And feel absolutely no resentment whatsoever for how my life is going is much, much more enjoyable than watching the movie. The movie is entertaining, but the peacefulness, the calm, is a totally different feeling. So just like I gave you the example of I cannot describe to you the taste of a mango, that experience is very difficult to describe. <coughs> I think the only way for you to know what joy feels like, that peacefulness, that calmness, is to experience it once. When you experience that, in my view, it trumps entertainment every single time. I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't want, as the Chinese will say, uh, I don't want an interesting life. I want a joyful life. Maybe part of that is age as well, but hey, you know, a joyful life that you can complement with entertainment. We spoke about that when we spoke about pleasure, happiness, and joy. A joyful life that is peaceful, calm, predictable, that you can complement with entertainment when you want to. That's, to me, a better life. Hey, Mo, uh, we have about two minutes left. So uh, how about this? We take one or two more questions, and then we open it up and you know, hang out. OK, so if, we're going, if we have two more questions, I'll tell you my golden tip of happiness. OK? My golden tip of happiness is the following. Uh, most of the time, our Western world tells us that we, uh, that we have to believe in something. OK? Most of the time, because of the illusion of knowledge, there is no way you can prove for or against anything, okay? Now, my golden tip of happiness is, if, there, if you're faced with two choices, neither of which you can prove with certainty, please choose the one that makes you happy, okay? Now, my story was very, very interesting. I do, you don't need to believe it, okay? But my, when my son left, I had a very weird tune ringing in my brain for the first four days, okay? I had no idea what, why it kept ringing in my brain. It just kept ringing in my brain for the first four days. My son had just left, okay? I'm not supposed to be entertaining music in this moment, right? I kept searching for what that tune was, and then I uh, ended up um, um, re re remembering that this was a song that we heard together in a concert that was called Video Games Life. It was the song from the game Portal, which is one of our favorite games of all time. I had not finished Portal. I wasn't good enough at the time. I didn't put the time behind it. That theme song happened and the credits at the end. Okay? Heard it in that concert, forgot about it, never heard it again. For four days, it kept ringing in my head. And then I decided to discover what that is. I looked for it on, the, on, on YouTube. It's, uh, you know, it, it, it ended up being that song, and so I listened to it. Okay? Now, the lyrics of, the, of that song gave me a very interesting hope in what Ali is doing right now. Okay? Now, 
Of course, you can tell yourself, this boy is delusional, right? He thinks that his son sent him a message, or the universe is sending him a song, okay? Yeah, I cannot prove that, unfortunately, but I cannot prove otherwise. So I choose to believe it, okay? So I let you listen to this so that you just know uh, what I think, where I think Ali is right now. It's called, uh, yeah, as you can see. This was a triumph. I'm making a note here, huge success. It's hard to overstate my satisfaction. Aperture science. We do what we must because we can For the good of all of us Except the ones who are dead But there's no sense crying over every mistake You just keep on trying till you run out of cake And the science gets done And you make a neat plan For the people who are still alive Good, we're done.